Okay, uh, good morning everyone. So uh, this is the introduction to literature. Um, uh, this is our class, uh, our uh, last class before the end of the uh, summer semester. And I'll uh, try to cover uh, the material that I posted on Facebook, sorry, on, on e-learning uh, uh, titled um, The Elements of Drama, okay? So if you go to e-learning, you will find uh, uh, a PDF over there and I will explain that PDF for you. So, and this will be included in the final exam, okay? So I'm gonna share the screen now. Just give me a second. Okay, so before we, before we start talking about uh, uh, this text, okay, uh, I wanna do something quick, okay? Which is, we'll open another one. Here you go. Because I need another, okay, the elements of, yeah, this one. Okay, stop share, stop share. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay, so uh, in our previous discussion of, uh, uh, of the topics, uh, we uh, first discussed fiction, okay? We talked about uh, uh, the differences between uh, a, a novel, a short story, and uh, a novella, and uh, we talked about the plot, what kind of structure that the plot has, and also we talked about characterization, what kind of characters we have, first person, third person, second person, etc. Okay, these are the things that have to do with fiction, and fiction here uh, is different from drama. Drama uh, is something that we uh, see uh, on stage and on theater, okay? So if you go to theater, you will find uh, plays and you can watch them over there. And also, when we look at uh, drama, it has, uh, it has a structure, okay? It has a structure. So we will discuss this in detail. Now, before we discuss, you know, the three uh, types of, of drama, uh, sometimes we have more than three types, but, but mainly we have tragedy, comedy, tragic comedy. Sometimes we have uh, historical plays. So, and we talked about this, that tragedy talks about, you know, death or the, that death mainly is the theme of, of this play and suffering, violence, etc. Drama, the main uh, objective of, of, the, of the play is, is to, make, it's to make people laugh, okay? When you read comedy, you laugh, okay? But still, like, you may sometimes find some tragic events in in a comedy and vice versa. You also may find some comic events in, in a tragedy. And then we have tragic comedy. Tragic comedy is a combination of, of comedy and tragedy, okay? So tragic comedy, again, is a combination of, of comedy and tragedy. Okay, let's read and uh, discuss, uh, you know, what we have here. Most of us read more fiction than drama and are likely to encounter drama by watching films version of it. Nonetheless, the skills that you have developed in reading stories and poems come in handy when you read plays. And just as with fiction and poetry, you will understand and appreciate drama more fully by becoming familiar with the various elements of the genre. A character. Now, character, we always you know, talk about characters in drama, and this is very important. Character is, is possibly the most familiar and accessible of the elements. Both fiction and drama feature one or more Im imaginary persons who take part in the action. The word character refers not only to a person, okay, so it, it not only refers to, to a person who represents an imaginative plot, whether narrated or acted out, but also to the unique qualities that make up a personality. Okay, from one point of view, characters as, or character as a part, of, as a part in, in a plot and character as a kind of personality are both productions. The sort of person is likely to see things from a certain angle and behave in a certain way. Notice that the idea of character includes both the individual differences among people and the classification of similar people into types. Whereas much realistic fiction emphasizes unique individuals rather than general character types, drama often, and this is the difference here, 
between characters in fiction and drama. Whereas much realistic fiction emphasizes unique individuals rather than a general character types, drama, on the other hand, often compresses and simplifies personality. A play has only one or two hours at most and sometimes much less in which to show uh, situation, appearances and behaviors without descriptions or background other than the exposition provided in the dialogue. So here, as you can see, the difference between fiction and drama is that in drama, uh, we don't have a long time. Most of the time, uh, a play can be acted uh, on stage in, in two hours or two hours and a half. But fiction, in fiction, we have, you know, a novel that spans uh, years, for example. Uh, so, and because fiction uh, is not acted on, on stage, then time is not that important. But on, in drama, time should be taken into consideration that you have a very limited time. Okay, the advantage of uh, portraying characters in broader strokes is that it heightens the contrast between characters types adding to the drama difference provoke stronger reaction. Okay. Uh, plays are especially concerned with characters because of the concrete manner in which they portray people on stage. With a few exceptions, such as experiments in multimedia performance, the only words in the performance of a play are spoken by actors. Usually these actors are in character that is speaking as though they really were the people they play in the drama. Okay, so I'll read it again so make you understand this. Plays are especially concerned with the character because of the concrete manner in which they portray people on stage. With a few exceptions, such as exper experiments in multimedia performance, the only words in the performance of a play are spoken by actors, and usually these actors are in character, that is speaking as though they really were the people they play in drama. So simply, you know, uh, when you go to a play, okay, you see people acting and these people who are acting are taking the role in character, okay? Um, okay, rarely plays have narrator uh, who observes and comments on the, the action from the sidelines. And in some plays, a character may address the audience directly, but even when the actors apparently step aside outside of the imaginary frame, they are still part of the play and are still playing characters. So here is the difference that is very important between drama and fiction, is that in fiction we have a narrator, right? But in, in plays we rarely have uh, narrators because characters address audience directly. We don't need narrators here. We just need, you know, characters speaking to the audience right away. So if you are on stage, the characters on stage try to talk to the audience, okay? So in this case, the characters are the same as the narrators. Unlike fiction, because in fiction we have narrators uh, who, you know, are different from the characters. In fiction, the narrator's description and commentary can guide a reader's judgment about characters. Reading a play, you will have no such guide because the drama relies almost exclusively on indirect characterization. Uh, apart from uh, some clues about characters and stay in the stage directions, you will need to imagine the appearance, manners, and the movement of some speaking the lines assigned to any character. You, you can do this even as you read through a play for the first time, discovering the character's attitudes, motivation as the scenes unfold. So here, th there is something that you have to take into consideration. First of all, uh, when you read a play, okay, uh, you, in plays, you have something called stage directions. Now, what stage directions? Stage directions is that uh, these kinds of directions given by the author of the play, okay, and they help the reader understand the, the, the context, the situation, and the characters. That's called stage directions. Now, uh, when we read a novel, for example, we, the, the narrator has this function. The narrator in the novel, in fiction, tells us what is going to happen. He comments on the reader's uh, judgment and make people, you know, have judgments. But in play, instead of having a narrator, we have a stage direction, okay? This ability to, to predict the characters and then to uh, revise expectations as situation changes based not only on our experience of people in real life, but also on the familiarity with the types of characters and roles that occur in many dramatic forms. Consider the patterns of characters in many stories that are narrated and acted out, whether in any novel, 
comic books, television series, Hollywood films, or even video games. In many of these forms, there is a leading role, a main character, the protagonist. So the protagonist is the main character in the, in the work, okay? The title of the play, such as Hamlet and Antigone, or a little less obviously the death of a salesman, imply that the play will be about a central character. So who is the central character? The central character is the uh, protagonist. The protagonist is the central character. The chief object of the playwrights and the readers, our audience concern. Understanding the characters of the protagonist sometimes in contrast with the antagonist. Uh, okay sometimes in the, uh, contrast with the antagonist, the opponent of the main character. So who is the antagonist? The antagonist is against the protagonist. The protagonist is the central character and he is the good one. The antagonist is the one who's against the protagonist, the opposite, okay? And becomes the consuming interest of such play, especially in more traditional or popular genres. The protagonist may be called a hero or heroine, okay? And the antagonist may be called villain. So here we have different names for these uh, two you know, types of characters. The protagonist can be called a hero or a heroine, and the antagonist can be called villain. Most of the characterization in professional theater or theater, however, avoids depicting pure good and, and pure evil in fighting to the death. Most characters possess both negative and redeeming qualities. So uh, what's going on here is that, you know, in, in later plays, we, we don't have, you know, just pure characters, either evil or bad. Some characters have, are good, but they have some negative or evil, uh, you know, characteristics and vice versa. As in other genres that represent people in action and drama, there are minor characters or supporting roles. Okay, now if you notice before, we talk about the protagonist and the antagonist. These are major characters, but we have also minor characters, okay? or support, that have supporting roles. At least since ancient Rome, romantic comedies have been structured around a leading man and a woman, along with a comparable pair, often the buddies of the leads, whose problems may be less serious, whose characters may be less complex, or, or who in other ways support or complicate rather than dominate the action. So here, this is what we mean by, by the minor character. The minor character is, is a character in the play who does not have a major role. Okay, uh, so uh, this character has problems, but these problems may be less serious, whose characters may be less complex, or in other ways support or complicate the main uh, action. Okay, so what, what, the, what this means is that when we have minor characters, their purpose is to help the major characters and to help complicate the action of the play, but they don't have a major role in the play. Sometimes a minor character can be said to be a foil. Okay, what does a foil mean here? A character designed to bring our out qualities in another character by contrast, okay? So foil here uh, is a character that help us understand the main character, okay? For example, if you have a good character, then you have a foil character who, who ha who's bad, and because this character is bad, we understand that the other character is good. Okay, that's called the, the foil character. The main point to remember is that all the characters in drama are independent, interdependent and help characterize each other. Though dialogue and behavior each bring out what is characteristics in, in the other. Like movies, plays must uh, respect certain limitations. The time, can, uh, the time an audience can be expected to sit and watch, the attention and sympathy an audience is likely to give to the various characters and the amount of exposition that can be shown rather than uh, spoken aloud. Because of these constraints, playwrights, so here we have some constraints in, in, in playwrights, okay, or in, in watching a play. First of all, we have these limitations. First of all, the time. You know, if you want to watch a play, how long do you expect yourself to go to watch a play? An hour, two hours, three hours, and then you have to leave. You cannot, for example, watch a play for days, right? So time is very important. And also, uh, the response, the feelings that you have as an audience. Would you cry when you see someone die? Would you laugh when you some, see a uh, you know, funny action? So uh, all these uh, you know, uh, are very important you know, in the play. 
uh, playwrights, screenwriters, and cast directors and actors may rely on shortcuts to convey characters. Everyone involved, including the audience, consciously or unconsciously relies on stereotypes of various social roles to flesh out the dramatic action. Even a play that seeks to undermine stereotypes must still invoke them. In the United States today, casting or typecasting usually relies on actors' social identity, from gender and race to occupation, region, and age. However, plays that rely too much on stereotypes, positive or negative, may leave everyone disappointed or offended. A role that defies stereotypes can be more interesting uh, to perform and to watch. Alternatively, a character can be so exceptionally and unfamiliar that the audience will fail to recognize any connection to people they might meet and their responses will fall flat. All dramatic roles then must have some connection to types of personalities in good role. Modify such as types uh, just enough to make the characters interesting. Playwrights often overturn or modify expectations of characters in order to surprise the audience. So too do the actors who play the parts. So here most of the, this paragraph talks about uh, characters as types. What do we mean by types or stereotypes? Types or stereotypes is that, is that that these characters are well known. For example, the, the, the old man. The old man is a type of character, right? Or the young man, or the witch, or uh, the thief. These are called type characters because they represent something. The thief represent evil. The old man represent wisdom. Uh, the young man represents, you know, youth and, and life, etc. So these are called types. Now stereotypes, uh, is something that has to do with misconceptions that you have a character and because of that character okay you make some generalizations for example if he's a black then um, you have some kind of stereotypes about about that black person or if he's an Arab you'll say oh that Arab person he has a camel he lives in the desert he etc and etc so so this is what we call by stereotypes okay uh, every performance of a given character, like every production of a play, is interpretation. Not just adaptation, Greek or Elizabethan plays sit in modern times and perform in modern dress. For example, but even productions that seek to adhere faithfully to the written uh, plays are interpretation of what is vital or essential in it. John Malkovich in the, eight, in the 1983-84 production of The Death of a Salesman did not portray Biff Lohman as an outgoing, successful, hail fellow, well met joke. Though that is apparently how the playwright originally envisioned the part. Malkovich saw Biff as only pretending to be a jock. The big time athletes, he insisted, did not or don't glad hand people. They wait for people to come to them. The actor did not change the author's word, but by intonation, body language, and stage business, wordless gestures and action, he suggested his own view of characters. In other words, he broke with the expectations associated with the character's type. As you read and develop your interpretation of a play, try imagine various interpretations of the, the characters in order to reveal different possible meanings in, in drama. So what's going on here is that there is a difference between the play itself and the interpretation or the adaptation of the play. Now, the adaptation of the play, okay, or the interpretation of the play is different from the play itself. And that's why, you know, if we have a play being adapted into a movie, we will have different movies because these two movies, for example, have different interpretations of the play. So what, what's going on here is that, uh, that the meaning or the interpretation of a play varies. And the same thing with characters. You can interpret character positively or negatively, you know, according to your interpretation and according to your reading. Question about characters. Read these questions. They are very helpful. You know, I think they will help you. Please read them. Okay. Uh, now the plot and structure. Now I don't want to talk about the plot and structure because, because we discussed this before. You know, I think it has the same structure as the as the novel, you know, we, we have the exposition or the introduction, we have the rising action, the climax, the falling action and the conclusion. So in this part, it talks about the same thing, rising action, turning point, falling action, resolution or conclusion. So read them by yourself. Okay, uh, right, so here five. 
Yeah, let's read them. Now, stage, stages, sets, and settings. Most of us have been to theater at one time or another, and we know what conventional modern stage, the proscenium stage looks like, a room with a wall messing between us and it, and the so-called fourth wall. So when we read a modern play that is one written during the past two or 300 years, and imagine it taking place before us, we think of it as happening on this kind of stage. Though there are also uh, other modern types of stage, the thrust stage, uh, where the audience sits around three sides of the major act, acting areas and the arena stage. So here we have, you know, three types of stages, okay? And these stages are, uh, are the, the modern stages. Remember, these are the modern stages, okay? Uh, so the, the Briseum stage, a room with the wall messing between us and the so-called fourth wall. So the thrust is where the audience sits around three sides of the major acting area. And the arena stage where the audience sits all the way around the acting area and players make their own interest and exit through the auditorium. Most of the plays are performed at, on a proscenium age. Okay, now, uh, stage, sorry. So how, how can we, what do we mean by this? Okay, let me just, I wanna show you, you know, Uh, on Google image, okay, Z, just give me a second, let me show you some stuff, proscenium stage, okay, So guys, here's a, an image of the proscenium stage, okay? That's the common stage that we have uh, when we watch uh, you know, a play, or this one, for example. So you have this place where, you, where the actors you know, have their own roles, and then we have what? We have these you know, chairs where people sit and watch the play, okay? That's one stage. Now the second one is the thrust stage. Thrust stage okay now look see the, the 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 way chairs are are you know divided is different from the previous one so it feels like like the 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 actors are very closer to uh to the audience than the previous one right that's called the thrust uh, stage now the last one which is uh the arena stage here Okay, the arena, it looks like, you know, when you are uh, watching, for example, a uh, boxing match or something like that, you have the arena stage, which uh, you have the audience circling the whole arena and the actors in the middle. So these are the kinds of stages that you have to uh, take into account. Ancient and Greek plays and the plays of Shakespeare were originally staged quite differently from the most modern plays. However, and although they may be played today on a proscenium uh, uh, stage, we might be confused as we read if we are unaware of the layout of the, ca of the theaters for which they were first written. In the Greek theater, the audience sat on a raised semicircle of the seats. Okay, amphitheater halfway around circle, circular area orchestra used primarily for dancing by the chorus. Okay, now amphitheater, I think uh, if you know uh, Mudaraj Romani, that's, that's, that's an example of amphitheater. That's an example of paste, okay. So this is the amphitheater. It's the same as as uh, Mudaraj Romani. Okay, now. Okay, now comparing this with, let's say, proscenium. Stage. This is proscenium stage. Where the whole you know audience sit in the back. Okay. Uh, okay, and uh, and as I as I show you, that's the pro, pro uh, 
the proscenium uh, stage, uh, just go to Google image and put the name of these stages. You will see the difference between uh, proscenium, thrust, and arena stages. Okay, let me go back to share our PDF again. Uh, here you go. Okay. All right, so uh, at the back of the orchestra was the skin or a stage house representing the palace or the temple before which the action took place. Uh, Shakespeare's stage, in contrast, basically involved a rectangular uh, area built inside uh, one end of a large enclosure like circular walled in yard. The audience stood on the ground or sat in stacked balconies around three sides of the principal acting area, rather like a thrust stage. So Shakespeare, uh, you know, uh, stage is more of a, a thrust stage and there were additional acting areas on either side of the stage, as well as a recessed area as, at its back. Okay, now, uh, now for Shakespeare's stage, he uh, acted his play in something called the Global, uh, oh, the Globe Theater, Globe, Globe Theater. And, and, and theater, this theater is, uh, is, or can be found in, in England, okay? Uh, let me show you here, let's uh, share screen. Okay, that's the, that's the Shakespearean, you know, kind of theater. And let me show you another one. Yeah, so you see like it's just a three part stage. Okay, the, and you have balconies where people, you know, can go and watch the plays. The, the, the people watch from balconies. Okay, that's the Globe Theater where Shakespeare used to uh, act his plays. And this theater, by the way, is or can be found now if you go to England, you will find and you can visit that kind of uh, theater. Okay, uh, so that's the Globe Theater by Shakespeare. All right, let's make, let's share. We're still share, get the PDF. And here you go. A, a trap door in the stage floor was used for occasional effects. The ghost of Hamlet's fa father probably entered and exited this way. Until three centuries ago, and certainly in Shakespeare's time, plays for larger paying audience were performed outdoors in daylight because of the difficulty and expensive lighting. If you are curious about Shakespeare's stage, you can visit a reconstruction of the globe. That's what I uh, searched uh, just a moment. London, England, either in person or online. Every summer plays by Shakespeare are performed there for larger international audiences willing to sit on hard benches around the arena or to stand as a groundlings, a lucky few of whom can lean on the stage near the feet of the actors. The wall and the background of the stage are beautifully carved and painted, but there is no painted scenery, minimal furniture, few costumes and changes, no lighting and no curtain around the stage and clothing hanging usually covers the recessed area at the uh, back of the sister. So the recessed area is like the area where the actors, you know, uh, change clothes uh, and have some kind of rest. They rest after they, uh, act. Three or four musicians play uh, period instruments on the balcony. As the design of the globe suggests, the conventions of dramatic writing and stage production have changed considerably over the century. And this is very important, guys. Certainly, this is true of the way playwrights convey a sense of place, of place, one of the two key ingredients that make up a play setting. So here, we will talk about the setting. Now, the setting there are, there are elements in the setting. We have the place, the time, and the setting. Okay, the, the place and the time and, uh, sorry, uh, in, in, in drama, we have something that's called the three unities. Now we have the unity of action, the unity of place, and the unity of time. Now the unity of place has to do with the setting of the play, okay? That's, that's the unity of the place. Usually the audience is asked to imagine that the featured section of the auditorium is actually a particular place somewhere else. The audience, of course, knows its stage, more or less bare or elaborately disguised, but they, act, they accept it as a kitchen, a public square, a wooden park, an open road, or a room in a castle or a hut. Oedipus King, or Oedipus King, uh, the king, takes place entirely before the palace at Thebes. Following the general convention of ancient Greek drama, the place setting never changes. When the action demands the presence of Theresius, for example, the scene does not shift to him. Instead, escorts bring him to the front of the palace. Similarly, important events that keep pace everywhere or elsewhere are described by witnesses who arrive on the scene. So simply here, 
you know, because it's very difficult to change the setting of the play, okay? So people are asked to imagine that they are in that kind of setting. For example, you ask people, oh, imagine that you have a storm. Imagine that you are in the sea. Imagine yourself that you are in the forest. So by asking the audience to imagine that feature of the section, that's the way you know it works in the past. In Shakespeare's theater, the conventions of the place are quite different. The acting arena does not represent a single specific place, but assume a temporary identity according to the characters who inhabit it. There can see, uh, costumes and their speeches. At the opening of Hamlet, we know we are at the sentry station because a man dressed as a soldier challenges two others. By line 15, we know that we are in Denmark because the actor professed to be legiment to the Dane. At the end of the scene, the actors leave the stage and in a sense take the sentry station with them. Shortly theater, or uh, thereafter, uh, a group of people who dress in court costumes, a man and a woman wearing uh, crowns appear. As a theater audience, we must surmise from the costumes and dialogues that the acting area has now become a royal court. When we read the play, the stage directions give us a cue that the place has changed. So again, the same thing, you know. Uh, uh, the, the audience are asked to imagine that the place is, is, is different. But here, the difference between, for example, and this is very important, guys, uh, the difference between uh, the Roman and the Greek, um, what is it? Yeah, the difference between the Greek drama, the ancient Greek drama, and the Shakespearean drama, okay, is that in the ancient drama, we have a single a setting here, okay? So, uh, so the, the place is single and cannot be changed. You, you have to act on the same place. For example, if you are in a farm, you are in the farm the whole day. The, 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 the play has to start and end in the same setting. So you have a single setting in, in ancient Greek drama. But in Shakespeare's theater, the place, you know, the conventions of place are quite different. The acting arena does not represent a single specific place, but uh, assumes a temporary identity according to the characters uh, who inhabit it, their costumes and their speeches. So simply, the place in Shakespeare changes. And here in one act, we have three changes to, to the place uh, in Shakespeare. Whereas in, in ancient Greek drama, the place does not change. It happens in a single place in Greek drama. All right. Uh, in modern play, however, there are likely to be several changes of the scene. So, uh, you know, it's more than even Shakespeare's time, the change in the scene, each marked by the lowering of the curtain or the darkening of the stage while uh, different sets and props are arranged. So here in, in modern drama, because of the technology and because of this, the effects and because of the things that we have, so stage directions, I'm oh, sorry, uh, the setting you know, changes all the time, okay? And that's why we have the sets and props. The sets, the design, the decorations and the sceneries and the props, the articles, the object used on stage. So all these things, you know, help the play you know, have more interesting and more, uh, you know, appealing uh, play to watch compared to the ancient Greek drama or to even Shakespearean play. Sometimes space is merely suggested a circle of sand at one end of the stage and a blank wall behind to emphasize universal themes or to stimulate audience's imagination. More typically, a set uses a realistic aid to imagination, okay. Uh, the set of trifle, for example, must include at least uh, a sink, a cupboard, uh, a stove, and a small table, a large kitchen table, and a rocking chair, as well as certain props. Uh, here, uh, bird cage, quilting pieces, and ornamental box. So, so these are examples of what we mean by sets and props. Time. Now, uh, now you remember I talked about the three unities of action. Uh, place, time, and setting, right? A place, time, and action. Place, time, and action. Now here we have the second thing, which is time. Okay. Uh, first, in the, uh, first we talk about uh, the place, and now we talk about this, uh, the, the time. And convention for representing time have also uh, altered across the centuries. There are four, the, the three or four centuries ago, European dramatists and critics admired the conventions of classical Greek drama, which they believe dictated the action of the play should represent a very short time. So in Greek drama, the play has to be within a very short time. 
sometimes as short as the actual performance time, two or three hours, just, you know, uh, two or three hours, that's the Greek drama. Uh, and certainly no longer than a single day, it should not be more than a day. So 24 hours, that's the maximum thing. This unity of time, okay, one of the three so-called the classical unity. So if I ask you in the test, what do we mean by the classical unity? We have three things, the unity of time, the unity of place, we discussed it before, and the unity of action, we'll discuss it, uh, you know, inshallah soon. Okay, so, okay, so uh, the classical unity is in pillar drama is to select the moment when the stable situation should change and to fill in the necessary uh, prior details by exposition. The same critics maintain that a play should be unified in plays and action, and we talked about this as well. The kind of bleeding leaving from Denmark to England or from court to forest that happens in Shakespeare's play as well as subplots were off limits according to such standards. In Trifles, which observes three unities, uh, all action before the investigator visit to the farmhouse is summarized by characters during their brief visit and the kitchen is the only part of the house seen by the audience. So simply here in Shakespeare, Shakespeare does not stick to the unity of action and the unity of place and the, the unity of time. In Shakespeare, we find plays that, that, that take years, not 24 hours, but years. In, in Shakespeare, we find the place changes, for example, from Denmark to England, to Italy, to uh, whatever place. But in, in, ancient, in ancient Greek drama, we have a, a, a unity of time because the time is from two to three hours and maximum one day, but it does not go over one day. Okay. When there are gaps and shifts in time, there are often indicated between scenes with the help of scenery and sound effects, stage directions, and notes in the program. An actor assists in conveying the ideas of time if his or her characters appear at different stage. Various conventions of classical or Elizabethan drama have also word, worked effectively to communicate to the audience the idea of the passage of time. From the, chor from the choral odes in Oedipus, on Oedipus, the king, or to, break the, to the breaks between scenes in Shakespeare's uh, place. Action with the play thus can take place in a wide range of locations in over many years than in, in one place and 24 hour period demanded by critics who believe in the classical unities. So that's, that's maybe the summary of it is that, you know, that the 24 hours period of time for time and the place has to be one single place. Okay. Uh, okay. And we can learn much about how a particular play work and what it means by paying attention to the way it handles settings and sets. Okay. So action, then it, it, it talks about a single action. Action, that's the classical or the ancient uh, drama. They focus on single action. Whereas in, in Shakespeare and in modern drama, the action is not single and unified, but we have different actions. And that's the difference between classical or ancient drama and Elizabethan or modern drama. Please read the questions. They are going to help you uh, in understanding these pages. And the last thing is the tone, language, and symbol. We will do, talk about these and, and, and that's all. We will not discuss the theme. So in place as in other literary genres, tone is difficult to specify or explain. Perhaps tone is more important in drama than in other, any other genres because it is in performance a spoken form Vocal tone always affects the meaning of a spoken word to some extent in any culture. Now tone here, what does tone mean? Tone, you can tell uh, from the way the characters speak, what kind of tone you have. Is the tone happy, sarcastic, funny, uh, serious? So these are kind of tones that you have. Now you have to decide the tone of the, the speaker and the tone of the, the play, okay? Uh, okay, the choice of the tone must be uh, a negotiation between the words of the playwrights and the interpretation and skills of the actors or readers. At times, stage directions will specify the tone of a line of a dialogue, though not uh, even that must be only a hint since there are many ways of speaking intensely or angrily. See that these are kind of tones also. Speak intensely or in an angry way. Find a line in one of the plays printed here that has a stage direction telling the actor how to deliver it. And with one or two other people take turning saying that it way. If nothing else, such an experiment may help you appreciate 
the talent of good actors who can put us on a certain tone of voice and make it seem natural and convincing. So it's, it's all about characters who can uh, help us understand the play and, uh, you know, interact with the play because of the tone that they use, whether the tone is angry, sad, happy, serious, sarcastic, funny, etc. Now, dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is very important, in which character's perception is contradicted uh, by what the audience know, even a situational, uh, okay, but by why character, by what, oh, sorry, uh, in which character's perception is contradicted by what the audience knows, okay? That's called dramatic irony. And I'll explain this, just give me a second. And even situational irony, okay, uh, in which character and the audience's expectations about uh, what will happen are contradicted by what actually does happen are relatively easy to detect. But verbal irony uh, in which a statement implies a meaning different from uh, its uh, obvious uh, literal meaning can be fairly subtle and easy to miss. Okay, so these are the, 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 the kinds of ironies that we have. We have dramatic irony where character's perception or character's understanding is contradicted with the audience. So we know something and the characters know something else. For example, a character believes that X is good, but we know that X is bad because we, the audience, know that character. We know that what he's thinking and what he's feeling. So the character's perception is contradicted or against what the audience knows. Now, situational irony, it, it depends on the situation in which characters and the audience's expectations about what will happen are contradicted by what actually happens are relatively easy to detect. So simply, the character's perception and the audience is contradicted with the situation itself. And that's why we call it situation. And because the situation contradicts our perception as audience and as characters. The last one is the verbal irony in which a statement implies a meaning quite different from its obvious literal meaning can be fairly subtle and easy to miss. So simply verbal irony, when you say something and you mean something else, for example, you, when someone breaks something and you say, oh, you are good. That's called verbal irony because you mean the opposite. Or if you hate someone and when you see that person, you always say, oh, you are my friend, you are my friend, but you hate that person. That's called verbal irony, okay? In the absence of a clear stage direction, verbal irony, like other aspects of the tone, can be a matter of interpretation. That is, directors and actors, as well as readers and audience, will often have to decide which lines in the play should be interpreted ironically. All three types of irony are nonetheless crucial to drama, as they very term dramatic irony suggests drama even more than fiction depends for its effects on gaps between what the various characters and audience know. And situational irony, the gap between expectations and outcomes and between uh, between uh, outcomes and even between the, what characters seem to deserve and what they get is uh, especially a key component of tragedy. So here again is another, you know, a summary of what situational, sorry, what situational and dramatic irony mean. Dramatic irony, characters versus audience. Situational irony, irony, characters and audience versus the situation, okay? Okay. Nevertheless, hesitate to apply the skills you have developed interpreting poetry to drama. After all, most early plays were written in some form of verse. Aspects of poetry often emerge in modern plays. For example, monologues or extended speeches by count characters. They rarely rhyme or have regular meter, may allow greater eloquence than is usually in everyday speech and may include revealing imagery and figures of a speech. A character in Lorton Hansberry, a raisin in the sun, for example, uses metaphors and personification, as well as alliteration to great effect when she remarks, okay, I think, skip this. Okay. Symbol actions or objects to often have metaphorical significance or turn into symbol. Effective play often uses props in this way, as rifle does with the, with the bird in, and its cage. And some plays, like some poems, may even be organized uh, uh, controlling metaphors. As you read, you play close attention to metaphors or images, whether in language or more in concrete forms. I think we explained the difference between uh, metaphor and simile. And we said that uh, metaphor, when you compare someone 
uh, or something to something else without using as or like. Similarly, you use as or like. For example, you say, he's a lion. He's a lion is a metaphor. He is like a lion. Like here is a simile. Last thing is allusion. Allusion is the reference to other words of literature or arts or sometimes else external to the play can enrich the text in similar ways. So allusion is very important. That's the definition of it. Okay, and that these are just examples of, of the allusions. Please read these questions uh, about what we discussed before. And that's all for today because I'm feeling very tired. It's very long, you know, discussion. Thank you very much, guys, for watching. And this is the last, you know, class for us. Uh, please watch the whole class and please comment on the video and uh, like the video because in this case, many people will be able to watch it. Thank you very much for... Uh, watching and have a wonderful day.